Hey, what's up, y'all? This is your girl, Diamond. How are you? So I brought my brother back. Y'all know him. Y'all have seen him before. And um, introduce yourself. Oh, what am I saying? You might have to bring me back in. A nigga. <laughs> you are introducing yourself. Oh, hi. I'm Diamond's brother. I'm Rakim. And that's all y'all need to know. <laughs> so this is my brother. I like that shirt. That shirt is cute. You know, well, well, it's a serious topic, but it's cute. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, just my homegirl uh, was making them and uh, hit me up about uh, getting some. And I was like, yeah. And it just came in yesterday. And I was like, what better day to wear it than today? Yes. You're looking, you're looking cute. You're looking you, like you're hitting the gym. Your skin is looking nice. You don't look as dusty as you normally do. What's going on? My campaign this year is um, healthy skin, healthy body. So we are still in the gym. Uh, I've been training for some some big stuff I got coming up. Uh, I'm going to tell you off the record. And also I've been using, just do, uh, using natural products, man. Um, I'm making my own sugar scrub now. I'm making my own. Uh, See, this is, this is the type of shit happen when you get a wife <laughs> that cares for you. <laughs> <laughs> they start inspiring niggas to do shit like this. So thank you, Shug. My woman or my wife does. Uh, she does make her own um, like co-wash. She does her own deep conditioning products and stuff like that. But she don't care for a Negro skin. Yeah, right. <laughs> So now I, but just, but just uh, playing around with some of the products and seeing some stuff and looking at some stuff and I start ordering some stuff really where I started, I started in Syria. Mm. Um, I, was, I was deployed in Syria and the sand was really rough on our skin out there uh, for black people and our skin was cracking and under that type of heat. And so what I started doing was I started buying natural products um just raw products raw shea butter uh jojoba oil uh mango uh, mango butter um coconut oil just in its raw form and what i started doing is just start playing around with it start learning its properties and what it does for the skin and the body and i started mixing my own stuff and i was like hmm let me get some jars and so all the black women i seen out there i was literally just getting i was like hey mama use this on your skin, use this on your hair. And cause they didn't really have the products out there. And uh, when the cargo- wait, came, wait, 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 what do you mean by that? What do I mean by what? They don't really have the products out there. They didn't have the, so we were in a situation where we didn't anticipate being in Syria. We ended oh, up- Oh, you talking about in Syria. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, I got it. I thought you was talking about in general. I was like, there's tons of women out here with body care products. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I had access to uh, to some of the cargo and I could get stuff in. I was mixing it up and handing it to them and they was uh, flourishing off of it. So, Oh, that's good. Decided to use it on me. Good. So, you know, I wanted to bring you in to uh, have a conversation with you about, um, you know, police and our experience with police. And I thought it's, it's a powerful conversation that me and you can share together because um, one of my first personal incidents with um, engagement with police has something to do with you. And I, it, and it might've been one of your first, not, I don't think it was, well, first of all, look, we are black. We grew up um, poor and in the hood. And um, when you grow up poor and in poor neighborhoods and you're black, you um you are in neighborhoods that are heavily policed so we okay. have been right mm -hmm. yeah so we have been um i don't remember a time that police um weren't somewhere either in a situation i remember my mother was being abused by um my young my middle brother's um father they were calm so police it, when we talk about the first time running into the police, it, 
I, I would have to go back to a time that I don't even fucking remember. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know if I ever told you, uh, if you ever know this, but um, I was there when they came and uh, picked Mama up one time. Mm-hmm. For, like for a long ride. Yeah. I was I was there uh, mm-hmm. one time, and uh, I think that, and you know, you know, my memory goes back to I'm just a weird person. Like I, no, I think it runs in our family because I remember an incident when I was two. Yeah, exactly, same. Yeah. So um, it's it's just super weird, and I just remember her. Um, I remember them knocking on the door. This them. This is my very first police incident. They knocked on the door, they covered the hole, and she asked, "Who is it?" And he said, "The maintenance man." Mm. And so, growing up, anytime I a real maintenance man would knock on the door, I'd be like, "Right." <laughs> So that was that was yeah. Mm, so I'm glad you brought Mama up because what what we're sh- the story that we're sharing with you all is basically an incident that the first time that I had came in contact with the police because in regards about me my personal situation with the police and Rakim was involved and so I'm glad that you brought Mama up because I have to give you some context and some backstory. Anybody who had followed our channel. Um, you have heard part of this story, so we're not going to go into detail, but um, but we're going to go into just to give you context of what led up to this. And, um, you know, so if you this is your first time seeing a video from me or, you know, you know, anything about us, you'll get some context. So this when I was. Um, right there. Now, I think uh, the one we did, the, the, the other one that we did, did it have Vivi, uh, video to it? Yeah, it was not the podcast one. Not we Rakim did an episode on Marsha's play on the podcast, but we also did a video when he was young, young. Well, you weren't young, young. You was like how old were you? Twenty. Yeah, like twenty. We did a video on my channel. Years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. And then we did a, a update on the podcast. So this is about um, you know, so you, if you listen to that stuff, you'll get because uh, mm-hmm. it was on Marsha's plate and it was recorded yeah. without my position, permission. I was just going to go ahead. You're lying. And You're lying. The law. You're lying. Thank you. But we, we don't have lies here. Come he on. Had permission. I had permission. He knew what he was doing. So yeah. Fuck out here. So, <laughs> so I just, you know the details of the story, but this is just to give context for people who haven't, um, who's, who's new. And, um, my mother, um, being the hood, loving black mother that she was early in our um, in our youth, um, you know, she did some things. She was trying to get stuff for us. She didn't have. She was a single um, teenage mama, and um, you know, she was trying to get stuff for us for Christmas. And my mother did some st- some credit card stunts and got caught and um well after so we had a great christmas <laughs> and um she had got um you know a charge some a fraud charge okay and so that led to you know run-ins with the law and um you know just being on probation and stuff like that so when my brother was born, about six months after my brother was born, my, my mother got um, caught up in drugs. And at this time, this early, late 80s, early 90s, well, early 90s, not late 80s. Um, at this time, the drug, the crack ec- epidemic and the, the culture around drugs was lock they ass up. Like if they're on drugs, they're out here doing drugs, they're super predators. Um, you know, especially around the the political narrative around Black people um, was their own drugs. And it's totally different now because now it, when we talk about the opioid crisis, they're like, oh, the people need help and resources. We want to put resources in the opioids. Now that it's the white people that's on opioids. 
<laughs> and the prescription drugs and shit like that. It's like, oh, we got to be tender because they ass going to jail or getting caught up or not really going to jail. They asses um, are being found dead in cars okay. with uh, ODing. And so now that this is, a, this is a crisis that is affecting white people in middle, middle America, there's a certain tenderness, a, hypocr a hypocritical tenderness around how to take care of these people. Oh, these people just have a disease. They don't know what they're doing. We got to give them resources to be able to get them off the drugs. It's a certain tenderness. What you say? All their children are dying. Or their children are dying. So it's a certain tenderness that when my mother, our mother, was on drugs, that they didn't give, they didn't give her that type of tenderness. It was lock their ass up. Who cares how it's going to affect their life? Don't give them any resources. The resources is put their ass in jail and pay <laughs> and pay for them to be in jail, the food that we're giving them. Those are the resources. And so my mother got caught up in the prison industrial complex. She was, you know, it started to be led to habitual offenses and, and she ended up going to prison. And so long story short, I ended up getting custody of my brother and he ended up staying with me for four or five years. Yeah, about four or five years. He was, um, I got him when he was like 11 or 12. And I stayed with my aunt who had six kids. And this is an aunt through marriage. And it's my uncle, my uncle Billy, who had passed away in, two, in 1998. It was, it's, it's her baby daddy. <laughs> and so, and so we, for, for whatever reason, I hadn't talked to her since 88. And this is 2002. And because how ancestors work and if you a Christian, how God works or, you know, however you, however you want to think about it. When we needed somebody to help step in and help us and give us a place to stay, boom, she pops up and we move in with her. So imagine what you say. Yeah, I didn't know who she was. <laughs> yeah, you never had met her. <laughs> so so when we move into the house, imagine six kids. She already has six kids, ranging from 18 to nine. How, how young was Keela when we met Keela? Oh, she was like 11. She was like 10. OK, I so 10. 12, so she 10, was Yeah, so somewhere around there. So like 10 to um, 18. And um, already six kids in there. And Rakim, who is 11, 12. And then me and the adult, my aunt, she was stripping. So she was, um, that's how she was taking care of the whole household herself. And this is a, this is why I love black women. Cause this is what happened. She literally got six kids to take care of. And then she add two more people all being taken care of on a stripper's income <laughs> community. Um, she's the one who introduced me to E5. She's the one who introduced uh, Orisha Worship and stuff like that. So she just was really just, at that time, just an on-time person for my life spiritually and just the help that I needed. So she said, you don't have to pay me anything. Just save your money and um, get you, use that money to get you your own place. So we stayed with her for how long? About two months? Well, auntie? Uh, yeah. I say about three, about three, about three months. months. So I, I found a job. I worked for Hewlett Packard. <laughs> I found a job and I worked for them at a, um, a computer assembly um, processing plant. And so when I when I worked there, um, I didn't share um, my transness because I wanted to just come to work. I didn't want my transness to be a big deal and. I had a cousin, play cousin. Um, she's actually my grandmother's best friend's daughter that we were raised kind of together because she was my grandmother's, her mother was my grandmother's best friend. Um, she worked at the plant and she ended up telling people that I was trans. Once she told people that I was trans. Pause, hold on, wait, 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 wait. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Huh? Are you talking about, uh... Nita's daughter? Yes. Kim. 
So Nita, yeah, Kim, Nita, Nita is my grandmother's best friend. Her daughter worked mm -hmm. at the plant. Mm -hmm. And so I come in, I'm looking out flat and beautiful. And all the men are like, ooh, who the new red bone? Da, 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 da. And apparently in the break room, <laughs> stop hating us, nigga. Um, in the break room, somebody was giving me a compliment, and she was like, "That's not even a that's not even a girl. That's a boy." And it led to them asking me questions, and I was like, "Why are you asking me about my business? I didn't want to confirm or deny. I was like, "Why are you asking me that? That's none of my business." But by me giving that kind of answer and not confirming, of course, that automatically is a, oh yeah, that's it. Because if I, you know, if I'm a sister to woman, I'm gonna be like, "What? Well, I'm a woman." But I didn't even want to go there. I didn't want to have the conversation. So it led to harassment starting to happen. And I don't want to be going into all that. We've already went into all that. So it led to harassment. And that job end up firing me. They end up saying, you know, it's easier for us to get rid of one trans person who, you know, is the source, not the, the cause, but the source of the problem, than to eliminate. Even around today? Huh? Are they even around today? They're not even a company anymore, right? Hewlett Packard? Yeah. Oh, I'm not for sure. I think so. I think they are. I'm not 100% for sure. But I know that plan is still open. Yes, because people work there in Indy. So, yeah, they probably are. So, um, he said that it's, he brought a meeting of me and the people that are harassing me. And they all, they all admitted what was happening. And the, they, all of them said it wasn't me. They all said, I didn't do anything. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. But he had them leave out the room and tell me, especially in the context of now this Supreme Court win that we just had that protect us from being fired. Um, he told me that it's easier for him to get rid of me, that one person, than to get rid of five people. Because if he gets rid of the five people, what's going to happen is he's going to hire five more people. And what if they have a problem with my transness and then we in the same situation? Mm -hmm. It's easier for him to get rid of me than to get rid of the people who have already been working there. So we know that's not fair. We know that's unjust. But we, I didn't have the protections that we do now. And, you know, I didn't have the time or the resources to fight that. So that's the situation was I was in. So a month into... Uh, living with my aunt, I found a place and a month into me finding my place and us moving into the new house, moving into the new house on the south side of Indianapolis, um, I was fired from my job. And so that led me into sex work. It led me into having to be able to survive. There was a pressure of, um, I was the trans person taking care of my potentially cisgendered heterosexual brother. And so the pressure was, um, you know, we had incidents in our family where, you know, people were saying, oh, why, why you want to, why you want to stay with Diamond? That's a faggot. <laughs> why you want to, um, you know, I, I, people saying, I don't think that boy should be living around that gay shit. I don't think that boy should be living. That's going to confuse him. And, huh? Yeah, talk about it. Yeah, that that's these are the conversations that we're having. That my family, ironically, the family who weren't breaking their neck to step up, but they had an issue with me being the one to step up. They had an issue with me being the one because I was a trans person. So the homophobia said, I mean, the homophobia and transphobia, but it's actually homophobia to my family because they don't even think there's a difference between homophobia and transphobia. <laughs> that all is in the same, <laughs> that is all in the same. I just learned that this week. That's why it's good to learn, <laughs> understand. And, and, and we've talked about this before, but he's saying he learned it this week, but we've talked about this before. Well, I didn't uh, know there was a, I didn't know it was a difference. Like, I, I was thinking it was kind of like a one in the same. Kind of like a, you know how, you know how, dang, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to mess this one up. Uh, 
Hispanics can be Latino, but there's certain there's certain Spanish people that can be Latino, but Latino can't be Spanish or something like that. Something like that. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking that it's like one and the same. I remember I, I made a post about like homo- two, two of the same in the same group. Two yeah. different things in the same group. I I'm, see I can see that. That homophobia is like the umbrella and transphobia is like a branch from it. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that I'm covering all the bases if I'm talking about homophobia, but it's actually, I actually learned that. Very specific. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So, and, and that, and that can come with conversation, but my family it was all homophobia and there was a pressure of, I cannot fail in this situation. I wanted to make sure that I had a place for Rakim to stay, that he was getting school clothes and school and, and shoes and all the things that I imagine comes with taking care of a teenage um, kid um, economically, because I wasn't rich. And so um, I applied for assistance. Of course, that's not enough to take because they were giving me $154. Yeah, it was like $154. That wasn't enough to do anything with. Um, and so I was applying for jobs, didn't get the job. So one of my homegirls was like, yo, put you up an ad, make it work. And so I put up an ad and I started escorting. So there was a time when I got a call from a client. And this goes into the meat and potatoes of our story. That's just to give you a context of what, what I was going through. Um, do you want to give some context of, from you, your perspective of what was happening with you living with me? Just, just in the house, like you, the transition from wherever you were to come into my house. What were you thinking? What was the experience just in the house, not leading up to that? What do you mean just in the house or just my mind state? Or, mm -hmm. Um... For me, it was uh, for me. It was going to be an exciting experience, just because uh, I don't know how much they know about our background and how we've always had a hand in hand uh, relationship. So Diamond would always make sure. Um, so I live. I lived with my grandmother for a very, very long time when my mother went to prison, and. The first time. Yeah, the first time. And so uh, up, up until I was about nine or 10 um, or nine, uh, she would find ways. We had this relationship where she would find ways, you know, her growing up in a group home and stuff, she would find way, uh, ways to come up and take two or three buses to come see me and visit me, um, make sure I always had a gift on my birthday, make sure I always had something for Christmas. I remember one Christmas, um, we took about five or six buses somewhere, man. And it probably, honestly, it probably was about a 20 minute, but as a kid, it just felt like we were on this extravagant adventure and we went and, um, got gifts for my grandmother as well. She gave me money so I can buy my own gift uh for grandmother and it we we just have always and there were certain things that i knew um as far as even like coming out i believe i was the first person you told i didn't really have to tell i didn't have to come out to my brothers i talked to my brothers as if i are they already knew <laughs> like if we're on this long ass bus ride i'm talking to them as if they already know what's up it was no kind of um, so I'm as a kid, I'm saying certain things. They like, what? How you know that? Or when did you and I'm just and I'm just thinking like because the conversations we we you know had, I'm thinking that, you know, it was just conversation, public knowledge or whatever is going on. And so we just always had this this relationship. We've always been close and I've never looked at um I never got a chance to even 
you look at um, homosexuals or transsexuals in a certain way because I was groomed. Um, I mean, I, I, I could see it. I could see, I could clearly see that there was something wrong because of the, you know, how family are. You know how family are and the looks that you get. You know, I'm, I was a very intelligent kid. So I understood what was going on, but what trumped it was like, man, you get what I'm saying? This is my sister. I'm just happy to be around you. I'll never get to see you, but when I do get to see you, it's lit. And so I, I understood what was going on, but the love has always trumped things for me. And so coming into it, I was very excited Not that I didn't like like my mom or anything like my grandmother, but it was just a certain bond that her and I shared. And I just knew it was going to be her and I, just her and I against the world type of thing. And that scenario to me was just, <clears throat> man, I couldn't imagine. It was, it was like, yo, this is so crazy. This is happening, but I'm happy this is happening. Um, this is, this is a, a very exciting time. And then I quickly, quickly realized what that comes with um, as far as homophobia and transphobia goes and um, being able, hearing things from our mother and hearing things from different family and then hearing things um, in the neighborhood or something that might come up at school and being in altercations and fighting or arguments. Um, I learned, I learned pretty quickly that, Hey, um, this is a, this is a, this is a rough, this is a rough lifestyle for me. This is what I'm thinking. Um, and not really taken to a taken into account because I'm a growing teen, not taken to the account. Man, if it was hard for me, <laughs> what it must be like for you. Yeah. Um, and coming home hearing you talk about being fired from your job and really and like listening to the reason, but not just so naive and not even well being a kid i don't even want to say yeah, just not even yeah. really understanding what that meant not really understanding what what that was like or what that meant it was just like a you know people get fired every day type of thing and right. it would make you know and, and not understanding the hatred behind it and the discrimination behind it um but for the most part, just living in the household, um, it, it 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 was it was a great it was a great experience. At the yeah, time. and so it was exciting for me because my brother was, um, you know, we most of the time it was, you know, my brother was a sense of joy. We when we come together, it just was fun and doing something that was fun, blah 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 blah. And but this is I'm coming into a in a different capacity now. I have to provide now i have to discipline now i have to you know he would do stuff i remember he got caught throwing rocks off the damn um bridge at cars with his friends and had to go to juvenile we had to pay fines and you know so now i'm in an adult situation it was it was um <laughs> you know older sibling younger sibling and it's all about fun the adults the other adults is doing all that taking care and discipline stuff but this i come in as the fun person and so um, now I'm in a situation where I have to do the disciplining and the fun stuff. And, you know, I'm buying the video games and doing the whooping. <laughs> so, you know, it was a whole different kind of scenario that I had never been in in my life or with my brother. But, you know, it, 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 overall, it was, it was pretty good. So because I had opened up the door to escorting, there were certain things that I... Um, that I set up as of um, precautionary things. So first of all, I didn't want my brother to have any kind of engagement with my client. So how our house was set up was Rakim's room was in the back of the house by the kitchen and the bathroom. And my room was up the stairs, upstairs. 
And so clients would come through the front door and go directly upstairs. They didn't have to see anybody. They didn't have to see anything. Um, I always answered the phone. So my brother never had contact with um, answering the phones with clients. Um, you know, I always answer the phone because anybody calling more than likely was a client because that phone number was the one that was in the ads. So he didn't need to answer the phone. I would answer the phone. <laughs> um, I think as years went on, years, like years, as because we, we were together for um, four or five years, um, as years went on, I remember him answering the phone <laughs> a few times. <laughs> but most of the time, um, that was like at the end of our little stint. But I remember it was, I am answering the phone. So there was no contact between him and the client. If I, if we also had rules set up in our house um, for us to, for him to know when I had, say, say that he was at the park or something and I had a client come, he, we had rules set up to, and ways to signal that I had a client so he couldn't come in the house or he had to leave when I had a client, something like that. So say what our rule was, was the, we had porch lights. So if the porch lights were, um, I don't know if it was on or if they're off. I can't remember, but say whatever the signal was, if it's on, no, no, no. Oh yeah. If it's on, there's no client in the house. It's the back, the, uh, the 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 back door. It's the back light. The back door. If if he comes home and he and you know and he sees the light on in um the um light on, there is no client in the house and he can just come and um come in the house. If the light if the back light door is on, then he knows. I mean, or it's off. He knows that there's a client in the house, so he can't just come in and make noise and blah 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 blah. He can't come in. Like once it's over, then I'll cut the light on. I'll come downstairs, let the client out, cut the light on so he knows that it's safe to come in. So we had these rules, these mechanisms to set up to make sure he never engaged with clients and he never um, um, interrupted when I had a client. So there was this one particular time. Um, we had been, um, it had gotten really slow. I had a couple of clients, but it had gotten really slow. And we were catching up on bills. We were catching up on bills. And I think my, like, I had just start. I, I had just started, or um, I had just started my job as a, um, at Bath and Body Works. This is my very first stint of that. I had, I had got, but it was a part-time job. And, um, I had been not working for so long that we had got pink slips for the lights. You know, if the lights about to be cut off, they mail you the little pink slip saying, hey, your shit about to be disconnected. We, I had got co contacted with, um, with, um, with my, um, with my landlord. He was coming, knocking on the door. I'm not answering. <laughs> Dodging him because I wanted to get enough money. And I had interviewed with Bath and Body Works, but I hadn't started. First of all, it was part-time, but I, but I also hadn't started yet. And so I was still trying to turn tricks or whatever, trying to get, get some money. So I was in a hot time where I needed the money so that we would not have our lights cut off. Like I needed it. And so a client comes and there's all, as an escort, there's all these rules about, um, you know, all these rules about what you can do, what you can't do, how you know a client is a client or how you know he's a cop. And one of those rules that I was always told is that most clients who are cops, they don't touch you. Like they don't fondle you. They don't touch your breast. They don't touch your piece because somebody is listening. Because if it's a sting, other cops are outside listening to the sting happening. So they don't really do anything that would, would make it seem like they gay or, you know, they don't, they won't touch you. They won't do anything like that. When we know that clients, clients that come in that are real clients, they, they come in to pay to touch you. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's kind of how it was. So when he came in, also another rule is there, a, a cop is going to be asking you specific questions. They're going to ask you the, uh, this is the amount of money that I have. What am I going to get? What is the sexual favor that I'm going to get for this amount of money? And they need you to say yes. 
because they, they're they recording and they need you to say, yes, I'm going to do this sexual favor for this amount of money. So when you see a, and most clients who are real clients, they're not going to want to have that kind of conversation because they're at risk too. This could be a thing for them too. So they're not going to come in, oh, I want to do this for this amount of money. If they do that, then they're a fucking cop. And that was the rules, okay? So he comes in, and it's a black guy, and he comes in, and he's like talking to me, and I'm saying, okay, well, let's get the business out of the way, blah, 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 blah. We're not having really any kind of direct talk. He was like, oh, my God, you're so beautiful, and oh, my God, you look just like your pictures, and da, da, da. And so he's trying to take my guard down. So he comes in, and he, um, he touches my breast and he touches my private part and um because i'm in sexy attire and so he um and he so once he does those things in my mind i'm like oh this probably is not a cop it, it's not all already 100 for sure but because he does those things i'm like oh this is not a cop so i said come on baby let's get the money out the way da, 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 da. and we get the money out the way i lay him down on the bed and i start giving him a massage and um he keeps asking me, am I going to get a, a sexual act for the money that I just gave you? And I was like, my, my antenna went up, but I don't want him to leave. Okay? I don't want him to leave. I don't want him to get in this. I don't want to, this to turn into some negative situation. And, um, you know, he's a black client. Black clients, in my experience, black clients, like um, treat me good. I know, I know other girls experience that's not the case, but he's a black client. I don't mind them. Cool. Let's do it. And so my antenna went up, but not just fully up. And I was like, don't worry about it. And, and he had already let my guard down. So he just kept kind of pushing it. And I was like, yes, sweetie. Yes. We're going to do all of that. Just relax. <laughs> just relax. That was my mistake. Letting my guard down because I needed to make sure this is all this is all good. So once we get started, um, I hear something downstairs. I thought it was a bang on the door. I thought that it was a, um, a bang on the door and somebody was saying to what's going on. So when I come downstairs, I, when I come down the stairs, I tell the client, not knowing that he's a police officer yet, I tell the client, one second, baby, and I get up. So I'm thinking that I know it's not Rakim because we already did the rules. <laughs> I know it's not Rakim. Um, but in the situation, I'm like, who is fuck is knocking on the door like this? But when I come down the stairs, Rakim is coming, meeting. And Rakim, you tell your position from that. What had happened 15 minutes or whatever minutes before that? Um, so I have been out of the house for probably a while, probably, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half. Um, I have been out of the house already. And we started out in the, we started out in the front, um, like kind of like on a corner, me and my friends just hanging out, chilling. And we noticed a, we did notice a van uh, sitting there that was just running. And the whole time we were on that corner, that van was just sitting there and it was just running. It wasn't, I'm not going to say it was suspicious, but like, I know I had never seen it before. Cool. So we leave. And so the way, I don't know, if you ever been to a Midwest city, you understand that they're, like this it's it goes the main street then there's an alley and then there's another main street so by the time if you walk half a block you're in the alley basically so we're getting ready to go to a friend's house i say yo hold up let me go grab my ball and i'm gonna meet y'all back at the crib so I hit the alley because I know that leads to my backyard. Go in, I hit the gate. I'm in my backyard, but as I'm heading to the door, I see that 
the light is off. So I know, like, I'm just thinking like, oh, okay, I'm just going to come in here quiet, grab my ball, and I'm going to bounce. I'm out of here. But walking to the door, I could kind of hear something on the side of the house. So from the door to the side of the house was just a basically a a lean over to see what was happening and i seen somebody and we don't have outside of this we really don't have like visitors or or anything going on so but if it was like a client or some i knew that they didn't have no business on the side of the house basically so it was just it was weird so i walk over just to see who it was and somebody said put your hands up and i said what i can't really i can't really see him but he's like put your hands up right now and i'm looking and i'm just looking at like like midsection and he has a gun up he has a gun up and he's like put your hands up right now and i'm i'm a kid so i don't really it doesn't really register to me it's almost kind of not funny but it's almost like a a not scary type of ordeal because I'm just so young and green and somebody telling me put my hands up and they got to I'm just like nah this ain't really happening and he's like come here and so I come here first of all this person had on plain clothes and when I get closer to the front now I see a uniformed officer and they're like Hey, come around here. And I'm like, and my, what's going on in my brain? I'm like, yo, I'm about to get in trouble. It's, I, I must have did something. I must have did something. And then I'm like, but I know I didn't do nothing. It's probably my friends must have did something. And I was just with my friends. And I'm like, this is like, what happened? I'm trying to figure out what happened. And they're like, hey, um, we need to get in here. So they take me to the front of the house and they're knocking. And I'm just like, well, what do you, what do you what do you want here? Like, what's going on? And they're like, um, tell tell uh, tell whoever it is uh, to come out. And I was like, well, she's not about to open the door because I know how to get in. And so they was like, oh, well, get in and let us in. So I go to the back and come in my normal way that I would come in. And um, by the time I get to the front of the house that's when that's when i i see you and the look on my face and the look on your face we kind of already kind of could figure out without even saying nothing what was going on yeah and um because guess- he was coming the dude was coming down the stairs. You were coming around the corner, and I hear people on the porch. I hear white people on our porch. So I'm like, oh, this is a scene. And, you know, we, we share a small conversation. I was like, yo, they just had. Guns they just put out on me. Had the gun out on me. And we just sitting there and, and like, I was like, I, in my, when you said that, because I, you know, I prepare for the prostitution bus situation. I, because I'm like, it, it could happen. Like, you know, so I already went through my mind in that regards. But when you said they pulled the gun out on you, I was like, why would you pull a gun out on a 12 year old? Like, in my mind, I'm like, what? Over or a prostitution scene? Like, what is going on? In your head, in my head, I'm I'm thinking about like, I'm not even registering. I'm so young. I'm not even registering that I just. This is a traumatic experience that I'm always going to remember. 
You get what I'm saying? And not knowing the danger that I was just put in. I'm just thinking about what was going on in my brain right there. I'm just like, yo, somebody about to go to jail. You get what I'm, I'm like, yo, somebody about to go to jail. Um, and I'm looking at the dude, the, the dude, the client, and I'm like, what? I'm just looking at him like, yo, it was kind of like a, what? Like, what's happening right now? Like, really? What are you doing? I'm not even, my head wasn't even on the, you know, what just happened to me per se, but you know, you being my older sister, you like, yo, y'all just pulled a, you know what I mean? Right. And so what, what ended up happening is I end up, oh, the guy ended up saying that he was the police. So the guy that was already in the house, which all of this was strange. Them, them saying, open up the door, having you come in, open the door. Why didn't they come through the back with you? Or all this shit was weird to me. And then he could have came and opened the door because he's a cop. It just, I don't know how that all worked, but them, all that, so I opened up the door and, um, no, 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 the cop says, tells me that he's a cop and he tells you to sit down on the stairs. How our house was, the living room was when you first come in and then the stairs would go up. So he tells you to sit down on the stairs, he opens up the door and then these white cops come in. And it's a maybe like four of them in total, one, two in police, two in regular clothes and two in, um, in, um, off uniform and then they commence to say um then the transphobia disrespectful stuff go out they once they talk up they ask me my tea and then it, it's not that they don't know my tea it's just that they have to confirm it and um um then they started ask they start misgendering me and because my name wasn't changed at the time they were calling me by my um dead name and they were saying, um, "Sir, what do do you know this is? Do you know this is illegal, um, sir? Why are you um, like really emphasizing, sir? Um, sir, why are you um, putting your brother at risk by bringing strange men? You know this is illegal. You know this is that right. You don't need to, sir. You don't need to have him. This is a bad influence on him with him being in your house, and um, sir." This is <laughs> not how it's supposed to go down and blah, 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 blah. So in that moment, I am feeling, I, there's a there's an embarrassment that's happening. Um, embarrassment in front of my brother that this is happening, that I'm getting busted for prostitution in front of my brother. Them saying this type of stuff is adding to the embarrassment. And it's also adding to my anger because how dare you judge me and you don't know my situation. I can tell that you, I can tell that you don't really give a fuck, um, but you don't know all this backstory that led to this situation. And um, you don't really care because you're not asking me about how, what led to this. You're not really caring. You're really judging me because I'm a trans person and you are trying to chastise me for being a bad example for this cisgender potentially straight man that you are more invested in his upbringing and you want to teach me a lesson or chastise me about how I am failing in this situation by being a good male example to this man. Is that my nephew? Hey, come on, get on camera. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I see my bike today. Hello. I'm taking a long. Hey, Shug. I see my bike. I love You did. Y'all look alike too on the slick. We do. <laughs> <laughs> So it was, you didn't really care. They were more invested in the idea of this is a young man that you are supposed to be the big brother to. 
you were supposed, and then here you are dressing up like a girl, prostituting, being this bad example. And because I thought that at that time that they were saying all this shit to me, I thought that I was getting locked up. So I didn't want to be feisty. I didn't want to say anything disrespectful. I didn't want to get them angry. So I was just sitting there just kind of listening. So there was an, a shame, there was an embarrassment, there was a um, anger while I had to sit there and be quiet, while they were just kind of disrespecting. First of all, this is a prostitution charge. Why are you giving me fucking counseling lessons? I don't ask you for this. <laughs> and so, so luckily for me in Indiana at the time, I don't know if this was a statewide situation, but this was a city thing where they didn't actually lock you up for prostitution. They gave you a ticket. They gave you a citation where you had to pay a fine for prostituting. And so once I realized that I wasn't getting locked up, because remember I explained to you in the beginning that there was a pressure of me not failing in this situation and how embarrassing would it have been if I would have gotten locked up and then my family heard that I got locked up and I would, now I have to be the failure of, oh, he was over there prostituting and being a faggot, being gay. That's what they all do. Be hoes, catch AIDS, have sex, blah, 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 blah. And then Rakim had to go to juvenile, I had to go to a group home. It would have been so embarrassing. It would have been a failure. It would have been, even though I was forced into this situation. Um, and so, once I found out that we, I wasn't going to get locked up, I was like, Phew. it was like, okay, I'm just going to take this ticket. And then, so yeah, they end up giving me a ticket and end up leaving. And so I wanted to talk about this, have this conversation with you because now that we are in this new era, we are in this new era of analyzing the police and defunding the police. And we were young, although you were super young. I was young too, and hadn't had that many engagements. And I was thinking about, when I was thinking about all the times that I had engaged with police officers and how it could turn, it could have turned out ugly. And I was thinking about Tamir Rice. I was thinking about Stefan Clark. And I was thinking about, um, you know, George Floyd and, and you know, um, Breonna Taylor. Um, Sandra Bland, all these people. And I'm thinking about how the things could turn out um, in our situation. Um, Tony McDay. Tony McDay, absolutely. Um, the fact that they pulled out a gun on you, you they never pulled out a gun on me. Because how, how this thing played out, you know, I didn't need, they didn't need to pull out guns on me. But with you, I'm, I'm not really for sure they necessarily needed to pull out a gun on you either, but it happened. And what would have happened if, you know, you were 12. That's the same age as Tamir Rice, right? He's like 11. You were 12. What if he would have shot you? What if you couldn't see that he had a gun initially and you were moving forward to see what he was doing? Because I remember how it looked. Remember, the, the light being off means that you couldn't come in. And so there were no lights back there. So you couldn't see who what was happening. And what if he was a scary ass cop that would have shot you? What if I was at all aggressive? Cause you don't, cause he's, in, he's just a white dude behind our house that you don't know. So many things could have happened. And I was thinking about how devastated I would have been, how that would have changed the directory of my mental life if my brother had gotten shot over this situation. It would have been the police officer's fault, but they wouldn't have been at my house if I wasn't trying to survive. Very, um, it's, fu it's funny that we're having this conversation. Um, I was just on the, on the phone with one of my homeboys the other day, and we were, I was just kind of uh, recollecting like or recalling all the incidents that I've had uh, with the police and I've <clears throat> and you don't really you for me I didn't really 
take them into account as a as a black person i'm not going to say black man as a black person there are so many things that you just accept as everyday life having run-ins and having unpleasant run-ins with the police are just one of them yep them having unnecessarily aggressive attitudes them totally opposite of what i learned in school because the, the officer that came to my school as officer friendly was friendly like they train you to trust them <coughs> until you step out into the real world right and until you and i can't even i can't even really say this because it would be so disrespectful to to mayor rice to say that until you fit that super predator description and it would be so disrespectful to those boys um the central park park five boys um to to say that but you think that if you're a child and you're green and you're innocent that you would not have those type of experiences right. and in his case in tamir rice's case you it, 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 it just wasn't um the case so i'm i'm, I'm remembering all the run-ins that i've had with the police because i'm angry now i'm upset and wait wait wait, wait. and and then the context of what, what we talked about in regards to tamir rice i can remember you just said that the gun when you didn't trigger it didn't trigger your mind as a danger i'm i'm getting into that i'm getting into exactly that so when i'm recalling these incidents i'm i'm angry now and so i'm thinking about all the times because i easily see uh george floyd and i think about you know that could easily be me you know, I think about Tony McDay and that could easily be you. You get what I'm saying? I think about, um, and it's crazy that we're, we're, we're still talking about this neighborhood and this particular area in Indianapolis where we are. And I think about Breonna Taylor, uh, my best friend of 12 years at the time, they ran up in his house and the, the house that I was going to to grab my basketball to uh, I'm, I'm i'm getting chills right now thinking about it the house that i was heading to immediately after that same oh, okay, house right, i don't think you added that rakim was coming back to to the house when i was having the client that the the the, the, the prostitution scene Rakim yeah. was coming back to to the house to get his basketball to go to his friend's house which is behind ours and um they they ran in 2014 they ran into his house on a no knock order um like they did brianna taylor and the, the, ex the exact same scenario um i don't know who you are you're busting into my house i let off a shot and they just swish cheesed him like it to and so i'm thinking about all these things and I'm upset and I'm just recalling all the times I've had run-ins with them. And I remember this time. And it's crazy that we're talking about this because I remember this time and this being my very first incident and definitely, definitely not the last incident where I was confronted by police. I've done nothing wrong, but I have a gun pointed at me. And I was so I'm I was so young at the time. I don't even know the danger that I am in. <clears throat> I'm five four, maybe a hundred a hundred pounds soaking wet. To me, I'm thinking nobody would think I could possibly be any type of danger. I'm a kid. 
but yet I have this gun in, pointed in my direction. Eventually, as I'm walking up to see what's going on in my face to figure out what's going on, and I don't even know the danger that I was in at the time. I don't even know what's happening. And I'm so green. Being and so shot and killed was the very the furthest thing from my mind. And then I see a uniformed officer, and I'm like, oh, thank God you're here. And it's like, no, come on. I'm I'm with this person. You come on. Right. Um, and let's try to get in this house. And it, my thoughts and feelings at the time, I can't even, did I leave, did I leave that situation, um, associating, um, the police with any type of brutality or anything no because i was groomed as a kid this is my protection if anything happens call 911 run to a police officer or whatever but now that i'm an adult and i'm reflecting and i'm thinking about this unnecessary time as a 11 12 year old kid i have a gun in my face and it pisses me off that I went through that. And it pisses me off because I'm thinking about Tamir Rice on the playground with that toy gun and seeing a cop come up to him who, like you said, he's been trained to believe that this is safety. This is somebody who is there for my protection. And seconds later, this person kills him. And so it is, for me, I... I when I think about the situation, I think about it from your perspective and the guilt I would have had if something had happened and how I didn't think about it about until recently. And I was like, because I was even until recently when we start having these analysis of the police, I wasn't thinking about that that could have been a possibility. He was a 12 year old, but it I was. was. Moved from that, I was like, I, did, I dug so far. It was so many incidents with the police that that came to my mind first. And then I thought, that's why this is so crazy. We're having this, it was just the other day I was talking about this and I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. And then I said, um, and then I, just from my own personal perspective, because I was a little bit older than you. So I was not a green 12 year old. I was a semi green 22 year old, prostitute that was trying to survive and do. So I knew, I knew that I was doing something illegal. So it wasn't like I'm, I'm I, and I'm telling this story because it really doesn't matter in that situation. They should know how to de-escalate situation. They didn't come here on a drug bus. But get in, yeah, get into that, get into that part. Cause I yeah. think you told them that, uh, Indiana, you don't even go to jail. They don't even put you in cuffs for that. Yeah, they didn't even arrest, they didn't, it, it was a citation. And so they knew, they were in this van apparently because they didn't park the van in front of the house. We didn't see that at all. That was on, in somewhere else because I couldn't, I didn't see any van. Um, but they were in this van listening and they told us they were listening to the conversation. So you know that this is a prostitution bus. This is not a drug bus. This is not, this is a non-violent, misdemeanor offense that is happening at the most. And so the fact that you are here with guns dr being drawn, I thought it was super, super inappropriate. But looking at, now that I have a little bit more analysis of the structures that were up against me as a trans woman, I, uh, how I thought about it was all these things that led up to me being in this situation, all the systems of structure, when we talk about, um, the prison industrial complex locking my mother up when we talk about um not having the protect and, and i having to step in to take care of my brother on the three, um, on the three and just so you clear on the three strike rule right it was the three strike rule the 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 in the 90s the one that um hillary was being um was 
at Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, the whole Clinton administration, what they ran on one of the most racist campaigns that led to being tough on crime, the three strike rule, what Biden signed on to that we are trying to, um, that, we, that he's getting called out for, all these things, this was what my mother was affected by. Why I didn't have my mother in my life, why we were in the situation that we were in, where I had to step up and take care of my brother in the first place. So that's one layer that led to this. Nonviolent offenses. Nonviolent. My mother, three strike rule on nonviolent offenses. It wasn't, she murdered somebody and went to prison. Um, she never even had any drug charges. It was nonviolent forgery. Um, I think like she was in a car with somebody who had stole a car. So she didn't steal it, but she was in a car and yeah. she got a theft charge and violating the probation because my mother, because she was in love with your father, ended up moving to Boston. So that violated her probation. So those are three strikes. They had a warrant for her, blah, 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 blah. But that led to, and then her, her being on drugs and them not caring and giving her resources to get off of drugs. That whole system that she got caught up in, this is not to take any responsibility from her decisions, but also, to add, to add context to how some of her decisions were made worse by how the system <laughs> was not willing to help her and put her in a better position. So that led to me having to step in. Me having to step in, now you as a child who has me as your only quote unquote support system, now you have to be subject to the effects of my oppression. That's now me being fired for transphobia in this job. Now you are being affected and you don't even know that you're being affected, but you are. And now I don't have a job to take care of you and I got to figure out how to take care of you. I'm not on drugs. I don't, you know, we, I didn't even smoke weed. <laughs> like we, in, in our house, it wasn't none of that. I didn't even drink. <laughs> so it wasn't no drugs, weed, drinking, no nothing. We just had a cool ass house. And so it was none of that going on. And me getting fired for being trans, that system of oppression affected me getting into sex work. And then sex work, how they police sex work, when sex work should be decriminalized anyway, because it's two consenting adults doing what they're doing. So it really shouldn't be, for me, my, my politics around that, it shouldn't be illegal anyway. Um, trafficking should be illegal. But two grown adults having consensual sex, whether money is involved or not, should not be legal. Um, so how all of those systems of injustice and justice and um, oppression, how it all led to me being in this situation with being an escort and my brother could have passed away from these cops doing extra shit, pulling guns out. What if you would have accidentally shot what if he would have accidentally, quote unquote, accidentally shot you like that dude? No, 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 I do. I, I watched the video just like everybody else with Philando Castile. I do think that it was a accident. I, not accident. I don't know how to. I don't think he, I think he was just a scary ass cop and it just happened. Yeah, and I, I was telling somebody this as well. I think a lot of it is more so, I know I, I'm not trying to say you know, I know that people, some people are racially driven. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to put that out there. Don't kill me. But I think a lot of it is fear driven. Which is also racially driven. Which is also racially driven, which also goes back to what you were just talking about, the system and those super predator comments to make you fear us and criminalize us and be that scared where you can't even control he reaching for his fucking um, ID and you just accidentally out of fear, you know? Because when I'm looking at that particular tape, not to bring that memory out to people, when I looked at the Philando Castile tape, I could tell by watching that cop that it was not out of, I want to just shoot some nigga. It was out of um, that fear I do believe that sometimes people, I think, be lying and saying that they were scared just to make just that an excuse. Yeah. But I think in that video, it shows that particular, yeah. that particular case. 
I do think it showed based on what, how, you know, he was like, shit, like, like how his, he responded to it and how his body language, I do feel like it was, um, I don't, I don't know if accident was the right word, but unintentional. Um, I just think he was scary and didn't have the training and did what he do and it cost a man his life. And yeah. so what if that situation, you're in the dark because back the lights weren't on back there and you coming forward trying to figure out, is this nigga pointing a gun? And he would have took it into- forward, I could have been shot. Been thinking, oh my God, once I seen a gun, let me turn around and, and run. run. Uh, it's just so many ways that could have- all of those systems that led to me being here I would have lost my brother for that situation. I would have been distraught if, if I knew. There's no way for me not to have had guilt behind it. Even though I knew why I was, I was trying to really just take care of the household. But there's no way I would have not had guilt if it would have happened. There's no way that... Um, I really think they probably would end up killing me too because I know how angry I would have been if yeah. if 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 it had happened. Like if 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 I'm if y'all about to arrest and you like, oh, we had to shoot somebody and I would have figured out it was you, oh, it would shit would have went, it just would have went crazy. I just felt like it would have changed the trajectory of my life. And so I'm blessed that none of this happened. I'm blessed that we didn't have scary cops in this situation. Um I'm it's in my mind i just i that this situation reminds me of the oppression that could have led to what we are and you being a young black man in a situation with a gun being pointed on you and you didn't have anything to do with it and i kind of wanted to share that with the audience and talk about that and um you know and and how us now being older i'm, I'm i'll be 40 next year you are 30 this year um you'll be turning 30 in July, right? Yeah. yeah, turning 30. So it's like, I definitely, um, I wanted to talk about it and share that experience with the audience because I know now that you are, when I, when I think about, you know, how we are all interconnected, in, interconnected and how people, I, I know a lot, a lot of people as a trans person right now are saying that, um, well, they won't step up for us. I don't have the luxury of saying that. I have a brother, a black man, that I, a cishet black man that I care about. So I don't have the luxury to be like, oh, I'm not marching. <laughs> they wouldn't march for me as a trans person, so I'm not marching. I don't have the luxury to do that because I have, not only am I marching for myself as a black trans person, I'm also marching for um, the men of my life that I love. And I don't have the luxury to be able to um, make that kind of ultimatum. I'm not mad at you if you do. Um, what was you about to say? It was so beautiful. Um, so we participated in the protest and I'm so upset because I didn't get a chance to go out because I was working. And then when I, uh, when I wasn't working, I had our son here and, um, of course, I wasn't going to be one of those stupid people. And yes, I do think you're stupid if you brought your kids out. The protest. Yeah, that's weird because a protest can go less. And you got to, you have to understand that, that a protest can go left at any. Um, so we finally got a, a chance to, they were protesting again um, that Friday. So we got a chance to go out and it was beautiful, man. It was, you know, it was people everywhere um and you know it was a peaceful a peaceful protest um marched around and we got around to this block we had been walking for i don't know how long and uh we got to this block man and it was this um it was this lgbtq owned store or something or it was a, it may it may have been a um like a gay nightclub or something mm -hmm. it may it, it may have been one of those but i mean they were out 
Um, they had their signs. Most of them were white. Um, they had their Black Lives Matter shirts on. They had um, they had their signs, and they were out there passing out water. They had chips. Um, they had pickles in case you know you out there in the heat, you might cramp up. And they was out there with us, making sure everybody was good was just good to go and um i told i told dude out there i was like the next time y'all having something i'm gonna be out here you get what i'm saying um and, and i and i just wonder i wonder how many people actually appreciated that we didn't walk past all these businesses we didn't walk past all these stores and we get to the gay nightclub and they are out here and they short shorts, and I mean, they are going to town, letting y'all have it, letting y'all know Black Lives Matter. Um, and we appreciate y'all for being out here. I know y'all are walking. Here goes some water. Here goes some chips. Um, and just making sure everybody is straight. And I wondered how many people besides me and my wife appreciated that. Appreciated it and was able to look past the short shorts. Because, exactly. you know, some people would have looked at him and be like, oh, here they go with this gay shit. Oh, why they got them? And you're not even looking past at what is happening right. that w and appreciating at least the effort and the thought of doing it. You can't even get past the homophobia enough to look at what is happening. So I'm just blessed that you, you know, that you were able to see that. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It was it was beautiful, and I'm I'm, I'm glad I was able to uh, to see that. And I and I need to and I need to be more um, in this. I it's a lot of it's a lot of layers, man. It's a lot of it's a lot of things that I'm learning about myself, and you know about my about my privilege, and about you know some things I can do to to you know try to help bridge the gap and i know i'm just one person and i'm not a celebrity or anything like that but i do have people who look up to me and i do have people that may or may not follow some things that i say and i think it's i'm not gonna say it's my responsibility but i think that I should be more educational uh, on some issues, on some where, and, and on some things when it comes to women in particular, and when it comes to uh, trans women or um, just anybody of the LGBT community. Not only because, you know, I am fortunate to have someone in my family who is a part of the community but also if i <laughs> and this is this is crazy because if i care anything about the word discrimination put me having a family member aside um if i know anything about discrimination or if I preach anything about discrimination or if I'm a, uh, if I'm anti-discrimination I would quickly realize some of the things not only that I go through as a black man but what about a black woman what about a black trans woman what about a, a, a gay male not even white or black what about a gay male or a woman and there's there's certain things that we have to look at in ourselves and realize what are my privileges as an individual am i a white male with the ultimate privilege am i a white woman am i a straight man am i a uh, a gay man that's walking <laughs> you get what i'm saying because disability is um a thing that's a that's a disadvantage as well it's a disadvantage too so there there's a lot of things that that we can do 
individually if we if we recognize our privilege and there are some of the conversations that you and i have on the regular i'm always calling you hey what's this what did this mean well what's your thoughts on this because i'm trying to figure out there's some things that i'm not even realizing that's going on we were and i thought one thing about you i love that about you is when we do have those conversations you're not one of those dudes that kind of um are stuck in a mindset about something if it's some logical explanation you like you know what that's some real shit. it isn't like because some people when you present them with facts they like oh but ah, oh, but but ah, oh, but what about this and it'll be something they'll have it still doesn't change the facts and you're somebody that you will come with some with with your perspective and then when i give you something else to think about you're open to be like, you know what? That is true. That's a legit point. And I got to chew on that a little bit. That's some shit. I put a post um, and, and that's, 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 why I, that's why I say I need to be more educational. I put up a post and um, I said, I can't remember what I said, but basically I was saying, I, I hear a lot of us voice our discuss about racism But I also see these same individuals go on to promote uh, homophobia. Mm -hmm. There was some discussions on my post and we were talking about, you know, maybe people understand discrimination when it comes to this part, but you don't, un you don't even know or realize the discrimination when it comes to this part. And a, a lady, um, come in on my post and she was like, I shouldn't have put the post that I put up about homophobia. And she was like, I am, I'm biracial. I'm, I'm very anti-racist, um, you know. Oh, uh, these biracial motherfuckers, come yeah. on. Um, and she was like, you know, I'm trying to, uh, you know, I reckon I identify as black and blah, 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 blah. But she was like, I was voicing some views on a religious standpoint, not to say that they were right or wrong, but I realized that my perspective, that my post was out of perspective. Like, I shouldn't have been thinking about it in this way. And she was just basically thanking me for my post because I helped her realize like, how you saying this, but you doing this? Both of it is discrimination. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? And just that one person coming back and saying, you know what, you you said some shit right now. like. You 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 said some some deep some deep shit, and I need to change the way that I think. And just that one person is all I need for motivation to start having discussions with people. And I think that we need to stop. And I'm I'm one of the I'm one of those people until that conversation that be like, yo, I ain't about to educate nobody on no black issues and i ain't about to but i understand if you have that view but also understand that one conversation can change someone's perspective if you're willing to have it yeah I, 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 I can remember. i was one of them people i'm like listen i ain't educating nobody i'm deleting your ass um get up out of here i didn't i didn't cut i cut a real 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 close homeboy off like i mean it hurt my soul to have to do it but i was just like yo i'm not educating you bro at this point we walk in two different paths and and I, sometimes it's so far that that is what it is rakim like if, if you're in that kind of space where you give me a legitimate conversation but if you on some i didn't even give him i didn't even give i ain't even give him <laughs> under he put up a meme that was talking about um martin luther king was that was like i know you've seen the meme oh um never burn one building never rioted never bubble and i was like and y'all killed him 
and still killed him. And so just, I was so mad. I was like, get up out of here. Like, it's, you know what I'm saying? It's out of here. But I had a conversation with a person on my views as you know, um, the black perspective and what we're talking about. And he, it changed his perspective. And that, that conversation with the young lady, you know, about homophobia and transphobia and it, it, it shifted her mind. So it's going to take some people that's willing to have the conversation. Yeah. I know people are ignorant, but they're willing to like listen and listen to the logic and the facts of the situation. It could really help. And have the idea that it, you know, multiple things can be true at one time. We, 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 we can, like, I think dudes, especially black dudes, when we, when we call them out about their privilege, they, they're they sometimes, huh? They don't think there is none. Because they are so oppressed by white supremacy. They don't understand the other layers of privilege that they actually have and how those, all those things can be simultaneously true. But we have the same issue with white women too. It, you get what I'm saying? Because, because they're so oppressed by patriarchy, they don't understand the privilege that their race gives them. And sometimes they do. And so um, we have, especially as black women or black queer folks, we have the same, the same level just on different perspective of um, pushback from black men that we have from black women. Um, and we know they are on two different because it almost like their their privilege and oppression kind of equals them out because a black can black man can benefit more from his maleness sometimes than a than a woman than a white woman and sometimes a white woman can benefit from her whiteness more than a black male because of race in certain circumstances and men uh, that that are going to watch this uh, you just have to be. You got to put yourself in other people's shoes cuz I remember talking to you and and listening to some some of the things you were you were saying and I was just thinking like god this must be what it feels like as a black man when I'm just running down all the ways I'm oppressed and now I hear I have a trans woman talking about all the shit she oppressed and I expect this white man to listen to me and understand me and get my struggle. So now I have to listen to this trans woman, this black trans woman, understand her, get her struggle. And now I need to talk to my black male counterparts to get them on board or there's no, there's going to be no way that this black trans woman can advance or this gay man or gay woman to advance if I don't do the... If we don't gather our own people. Yeah. That's what it is. So brother, I absolutely love you. Love you to death. I, I love when you come and share my platform with me um, and share your thought process because I think what we have learned as us getting older together is that having these conversations really gives us a new analysis because sometimes we don't even think about things until we actually break down the conversation. And I love when we have those moments and, um, you know, and, and, and nobody, nobody in this world can analyze what we've been through in the way that we can because we have the intimate knowledge of it, no matter how many stories I done told on YouTube or podcasts, it's just something that happens when we get to breaking down some of our experience in regards to our, um, our childhood and our young adulthood that is just magical to see how we um, break it down. And especially now that we have, you know, some political consciousness as we are older. And so um, I love sharing my platform with you because you always bring some gems. And I hope that everybody who is listening um, appreciate it as well. Um, all the links to um, contact me are going to be in the bottom. If you want to leave a comment, definitely um, leave a comment, share your experience, your first experience with police. I would love to hear some of my audience's um, experiences with police. Um, I would love to hear if you are a person in a place of privilege, a little bit more privilege as a black male, as a white woman. I would also love to um, hear some of your experiences in um, if you are a woke one, not if you're 
you know, the regular kind of, <laughs> if, uh, what are some of those moments that really, what are some of those aha moments that you had that made you realize your privilege um, in this world? And, you know, when was that moment that was really triggering, like, oh my God, maybe I should sit back and listen and, um, and not focus on my own oppression. How am I, how am I putting, no pun intended with George Floyd, but how am I putting my knee on somebody's neck? Mm. You know, and so thank you, brother, for joining me. I love you. For sure. Most deaf. <laughs> Be good. <laughs>